Welcome everyone to ISIS Parenting's breastfeeding webinar and chat. My name is Nancy Holtzman. I'm a mom and baby nurse educator, board certified lactation consultant and board certified in pediatrics. And I'm the mom of two older teenagers. I'm sitting here outside of Boston, Massachusetts in ISIS Parenting's home office in a small conference room that was previously a storage closet. And I am happy to be with you as I am every Thursday at 12 noon to talk about some of my favorite things, including breastfeeding and pumping. And with me today is Hillary, who is in our chit chat moderation role. So thank you, Hillary, who is uh, getting a great education, I think, week by week here. And um, what else can I tell you? Happy World Breastfeeding Week every um, August the first week of August, August 1st through 7th, is a national and international celebration of breastfeeding and breastfeeding awareness and education. And uh, at ISIS, we always celebrate World Breastfeeding Week with a sale, of course. And so if you are in the market for a new breast pump, you can get uh, your freestyle or your pump and style at $100 off. If you are looking for more milk storage bags and spare parts and nursing bras and pillows and all that good stuff. All of that is 20% off. Everything in the breastfeeding or for moms category, actually, which is nice to know because that includes things like petunia pickle bottom diaper bags and um, prenatal and nice, you know, uh, skincare products and so on. Okay, so this is beginning to sound like a sales pitch. So I uh, will shift gears and uh, move on to questions because that wasn't my intention. So today, first question comes in from a mom who is saying that she's trying to wean her three-month-old off the nipple shield. Usually starts the feeding with the shield and after a couple of minutes after letdown, takes the shield off. The, the boy baby latches awesome without it, but he wiggles, arches, flails, and sometimes whines. Is this a normal part of the weaning from the shield or are we having other issues here? Okay, congratulations, and um, I'll whip through my Nipple Shields webinar uh, slide deck here um, and then focus on the question at, at hand. Um, I think you're doing great, and, um, you know, the Nipple Shield, well, here, we'll just we'll just go through here, and people can uh, look at the archives and watch this, this whole webinar in more detail if they're interested. Um, I have some historical perspectives, some of my favorite Nipple Shields, like these ones made out of lead. <laughs> Uh, or wood or horn. Um, and the reason that nipple shields have such a bad rap is because the old fashioned nipple shields, these sombrero type, um, were, were thick rubber and did uh, interfere with the body's ability to, to signal the need to make milk. Um, newer nipple shields are very thin silicone and um, don't quite have that same issue, but I do usually recommend insurance pumping or uh, pumping after breastfeeding two or three or four, depending on the situation, times uh, a day. And that's because as you begin to wean your baby off the nipple shield, you want to make it easy and satisfying for your baby to get milk at the breast. Um, nipple shields can be given out like candy. And uh, in the hospital setting, they are often used as a Band-Aid for a breastfeeding problem um, because they need to get the baby latching and get the mom and baby discharged home. And uh, a nipple shield often is a, is a kind of a quick and dirty way of doing that without fixing the issue at hand. Um, but it can be, so it can be a crutch, but it can also be a useful tool um, because it can get a baby who will not latch, latching and breastfeeding. And ultimately that is the goal. Um, lots of reasons why a shield is an appropriate tool in certain situations. If a baby is premature, a shield can actually be an important bridge to breastfeeding. Premature babies, small babies can have difficulty maintaining a latch and keeping the nipple positioned properly in their mouth because they just don't generate enough vacuum pressure. Um, so sometimes, uh, for many reasons, shields are appropriately used. Shields can be used the wrong way as well. You don't just plunk it down over the nipple. They should be inverted or turned inside out and then placed over the nipple. And as it, um, as it pops itself back out, it draws the nipple deeply into the shield. So that's another thing to, to be aware of. Um, they do tend to get lost in the bed sheets. So most people that are dependent on nursing with a shield should have a small handful of shields available and they should maybe keep them in a little um, easier to find eyeglass case or um, Ziploc 
a container or something so that they don't get lost so easily. Um, I love this little picture. Shields are not um, the devil, and uh, they're not, you know, the um, the ultimate uh, angelic answer to everything. Uh, but like any other tool, they can be used or misused. So let's talk a little bit about weaning from the shield. And it sounds like you're doing a good job because you're you're pretty much already there. Um, you do it um, you do it consistently, uh, but you can pick and choose. So uh, if your baby seems to latch easier in the morning without the shield, then that might be the time that you focus on it by the end of the day. If you've just about had it and you don't you don't have the energy uh, or the emotional uh, energy to, to struggle without the shield, then don't. Um, and remember that um, that breastfeeding with a shield is breastfeeding. Uh, if your baby is growing and, and gaining and thriving and transferring milk, um, then you're doing it right. But it is nice to get rid of the shield so that you don't have this little piece of plastic between you and you don't have to always be um, looking for it and um, grabbing it and having it not fall on the floor at Starbucks and so on. Um, so the third nipple from, <laughs> nipple? <laughs> the third um, bullet from the bottom. Um, this is what I was thinking in terms of your situation. Uh, compress the breast. So when he starts to get a little bit um, antsy and he's uh, maybe holding on with his gums and bucking around, tugging his head, squirming, fussing. It's a very common scenario. Babies do this a lot at the breast. Sometimes they're responding uh, to a slowness of flow. So after the milk lets down and the baby has had some rapid flow and then things slow down a little bit, sometimes they do that tugging and squirming as a way to initiate another milk letdown. Or sometimes they're just expressing um, their disapproval at, um, at the change of the flow rate of the milk. So doing breast compression, a long firm squeeze at the base of the breast, and maintain that pressure that firms up the breast tissue and nudges the nipple a little deeper in the baby's mouth. It can also help uh, yield another milk letdown. It increases the positive pressure in the breast tissue, helps move high fat milk down. So I would try a series of breast compressions when he starts to get a little bit um, fussy at the breast. Other reasons or questions I would just put out there for many babies who get a little fussy and, and wiggle and arch and cry and tug at the breast a little bit, uh, could be the milk flow, whether it's um, a little too slow or a little too fast for their liking, either can cause that. Um, could be uh, that the baby is having some gastrocolic reflex or feeling the sensations of peristalsis. Um, usually about 10 minutes into feeding, five to 10 minutes into feeding, uh, particularly newborns, maybe uh, during the first one to two months or so, tend to get quite squirmy, um, turn red, arch, fuss, and pass gas or have a BM. So it could be that he's experiencing that gastric motility sensation. Um, or it could be that he's ready to switch sides. And I know that with a nipple shield and moving away from the nipple shield, it's a little trickier to practice that nursing on three breasts scenario that I sometimes talk about, where you just keep switching baby side to side, side to side, so that he may nurse for seven minutes on one breast and then five minutes on the other. And then when he starts to get impatient and tug on the other breast, you put him back on the first breast again. Um, so that's another thing to think about. Also, if he's being um, efficient, he might be done. Sometimes one of the reasons why uh, babies, older babies around three and four months old start fussing at the breast is because mom is settling into that usual 30 or 40 minute feeding, uh, 15 or 20 minutes in, and the baby uh, is done and bored, and mom keeps trying to put the baby back to the breast to latch, and the baby keeps um, protesting. So just a few other things to think about. I think you're doing a good job. Um, and it's up to you if and when you decide you want to, you know, kind of gather up all the shields and, and put them away somewhere when you feel like you're ready to really just move to that next step. Um, things not to do when you're weaning from a nipple shield is get too frustrated um, or try to, you know, starve the baby out. Um, and um, yeah, and another thing to think about is uh, for the, whatever reason you began using the shield, whether um, from you know nipple damage or latching issues, or uh, sometimes women that do have flatter or inverted nipples begin using a shield, and know that it may not reoccur if you should have another baby and another breastfeeding experience. Each one is different, um, and also um, usually nipples that start off on the flatter side are drawn out nicely from breastfeeding, and uh, babies will have an, an easier time latching. 
Okay, let's see. Hillary and I had a had a, um, a deck um, tutorial beforehand. So Hillary, could you put the other deck back while I go to the next question? And thank you very much. Next question, Angie says, thanks so much for these webinars. I nurse my 15 month old about three to four times a day. He drinks water, thank you, Hillary. He drinks water out of straw cups, but only small amounts and does not like cow's milk. He does love yogurt and cheese. My big concern is fluid intake. He's probably lucky to drink four to six ounces of water a day should he be drinking more. Okay, that's a great question. Um, I think that he would drink to thirst. If you offer him a um, sippy cup and a straw cup, and it sounds like you do, um, he gets he gets um, dairy, he gets calcium and fat from other sources, yogurts and cheeses. Um, and um, remember that a lot of foods, including fruits, are about 90% fluid. So we think of so-called solid foods and mealtime. Um, and certainly there are foods that are dry and don't have a lot of uh, water um, content like crackers and, and bread and things like that. But I bet that a fair amount of the stuff that, that your baby eats does have a high water content. Really, the best uh, way to know that he's well hydrated is, uh, does he have a juicy mouth? Does he, does he drool sometimes or, you know, have a wet mouth? And uh, is he peeing his diapers? And I bet the answers to all those questions are yes. So especially if you're somewhere where the weather is warm, have water available so you can offer him water throughout the day. But by no means do you need to, you know, force fluids or worry that, um, that he needs to get a certain uh, amount. Um, let's see. And, you know, in, for me to say, well, and I do encourage you to continue offering cow's milk, it, it's kind of a weird thing because there's a whole school of thought that, you know, babies don't really need cow's milk after they wean. And, and um, you know, pediatricians are usually still pretty focused on, um, on, on toddlers and, and school age kids drinking milk every day. Um, but of course, they don't actually need milk. They need fluids, as you point out. They need fat, they need calcium, protein. Those can come from a variety of sources. Uh, I have an, a couple of ideas for you. In, again, I, I, I don't know why I'm trying to convince you to give your baby cow's milk. Um, I guess it's just <laughs> my, my training and, and just the way, you know, it's just the way I was brought up. Um, to believe this, but I would say that um, a lot of breast milk fed babies don't like whole milk initially because it um, it just tastes a little thicker and cr like creamier. It tastes different than um, breast milk and they may do better with uh, skim milk or 1%. So even though the common advice is to use whole milk or in some cases 2%, at least as a transition to offer your baby, why don't you try skim milk or 1% and see if that goes a little better. Um, and then another thought, if he does like the straw, is um, those Parmalat. I don't know if you guys know what Parmalat is. It's these little like juice boxes, but of um, shelf stable milk in those little uh, Tetra packs. So you can get that in the um, in the supermarket aisle that has like the carnation instant breakfast and the um, you know the condensed milk that whole section they are not in the refrigerator section but they 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 come in different sizes and different types of of cow's milk you know like skim or or two percent and or chocolate which I'm not recommending for you but if he likes to drink from a straw um, you know you could try that they come in like little four ounce. Um, juice box packets as well. So you could try it for fun. Okay, but as long as he's peeing and juicy, uh, don't worry about fluid. Okay, here's a question from a mom who says, I have a 12 day old, congratulations. Um, and uh, he's latching and feeding well. Again, congratulations. When is it okay to give him a pacifier? That is up to you. Um, I, would, I would try I would try to hold off um, just a little bit longer. You can use your finger, um, but on the other hand, if um, if he's at 12 days, if he's back at birth weight, um, beyond birth weight, and you feel like breastfeeding is going well, and you feel like um, after a good feeding session, if you swaddle him up and put a binky in and do a little jiggle jiggle and settle him down and he sleeps, you know, he falls asleep easily that way, um, you know, it's a pacifier, it's not crack cocaine, it's just a little piece of plastic. So I would wait until he's three weeks old, but at, there's no science there to say, you know, at two weeks it's not okay and at three weeks it is. So 
do what you want to do. Um, I like the in the in the sleep genre. Um, I like the Webinub as a as a pacifier because um, babies can begin to hold on to it and can find it sooner at five and six and seven months. They can find it in the crib a little bit easier, put it in and take it out on their own. Um, and in the car seat, the Webinub kind of helps um, hold the pacifier in place so the baby doesn't lose it, doesn't kind of doesn't fall out of the baby's mouth inadvertently as often. Okay, let's see. Next, here's a mom who says she's got a three-month-old boy and mastered uh, nursing while laying down during the night. Yay! But sometimes mom has a heavy flow and baby coughs, pulls on and off when this is happening. I'm wondering if there's an alternative position while laying down so I don't have to sit up um, or wake up fully. Yes, why don't you try, um, let's see, let me get the, I wonder if I put, I can't remember if I have the how to nurse lying down in the in the positioning stuff here. I think I might have added it. Let's see if I added it. Hang in there. No, I didn't. Okay, I mean, I have this one, but that's not the one I'm talking about. Um, so, get my little cursor. She never works very well on this computer. No, it doesn't work. Can't really drag it around. There we go. This mom, what if she put this arm here under her baby and that raised the baby's head up a little bit? So that's one thing I might try. Another thing you could try, because um, you know I like the, the, the rolled up blanket, the sausage to keep the baby on his side facing you so he doesn't, as he falls asleep, roll toward his back and then um, slide down the nipple and make you sore. But what if we took a little uh, folded receiving blanket and put it under his head and shoulders a little bit to help prop his upper body up. So those would be the two things um, that I would suggest. Uh, try seeing if it's comfortable for you to have your arm under his head and neck and shoulder to bring him up a little bit or see if a folded um, flat receiving blanket under there might help that as well. Um, and at three months, uh, he's rapidly growing into your heavy letdown. So um, it may not, you know, it often women that have overactive uh, letdowns or heavy supply, the baby seems to tolerate it better and better as they get older. So good. I'm glad that, that you're mastering that. That's a great skill to have, um, especially at, at three and four o'clock in the morning. And if it's your first baby and you don't have a toddler at home, it's also really nice at three o'clock in the afternoon to lay down uh, in a dim room with your baby and nurse your baby to sleep and then just, you know, kind of doze or read yourself. Here's a question from a mom who says, after 14 months of nursing, I'm wondering if my body will ever be the same. <laughs> Uh, I think it's after pregnancy will your body ever be the same. Um, my nipples seem to be permanently erect. I tried on a pre-baby bra and it felt so weird. Cups didn't fit or provide support in the right places. Is there hope for normalcy? No, there's not. Next question. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> you're a lady now. Uh, yeah, pregnancy changes your body a lot of different ways. Hold on, I'm going to put another another deck up just for fun. Document. This is one you guys can go watch later. This was our Valentine's Day webinar. I'm looking to see who's in the chat room today. Hey, Janet. And I don't know who, if any of you were, were here live, but we sure had fun with this one. It was um, sex, love, and breastfeeding. We didn't have any, uh... <laughs> look at that. Didn't have a, a nice intro page for that one. Okay. Um, so pregnancy changes your body a lot of ways. I think I listed them all this way. Um, and. Uh, your breasts. Let's just talk about what pregnancy and then breastfeeding does to your breasts. So whether or not you ever intend to breastfeed, your breasts prepare to breastfeed during pregnancy. And your breast tissue is mostly um, adipose tissue or fat. And then when you're pregnant, the hormones from uh, pregnancy help proliferate or grow more milk-making tissue. So some of the fat tissue is displaced 
for milk making tissue. And then when you are making milk, your breasts are bigger. And then um, usually around three or four months into lactation, your breasts begin to adapt or adjust a little bit. And so this is when some moms get nervous and say, um, I'm afraid I'm losing my milk because I'm, I'm breastfeeding and that seems to be going okay, but my breasts feel softer in between feeding sessions. I've gone back down a cup size. I'm not, I'm not waking up in a puddle, engorged and full all the time. I don't feel like I have two grapefruits on my chest. Um, and so, you know, that's a nice thing. It means your body is adjusting to breastfeeding. The milk is there and it's made when your baby requests it, but your, milk, but your breasts are not on autopilot, filling, filling, filling. Um, but what happens after you're finished breastfeeding, what's called involution, and what this means is that the milk making tissue, when it's not making milk anymore, begins to kind of shrink up a little bit. So it doesn't need to be active anymore, but it's already displaced some fat tissue. So the breasts are going to be less firm. And um, sometimes people will notice that, you know, the breasts are a little bit more jiggly um, and because there's less fat and they're less firm, they may be a little bit more droopy too. But this is not from breastfeeding. This is from pregnancy. And you could have a woman who had um, three babies, who gave birth to three babies, who never breastfed, never put the baby to the breast, went through, um, you know, engorgement, dried up her milk, and within two weeks was all done with, with the, the whole milk thing. Um, and she is going to have markedly uh, different breasts. They will have stretch marks and um, noticeable purple veins in the surface. The areola would be darker and so on, even though she had no breastfeeding. And they will be a little bit saggier um, and looser. And that's what happens to your breast tissue. And then your nipples, what happens to your nipples? I'll put this funny picture back. Um, what happens to your nipples from breastfeeding uh, is that your baby delightfully provides suction or vacuum um, and one by one breaks these tiny little um, hairs that these little fibers that hold your nipple back a little bit. So this is also why if women had uh, flatter nipples at the beginning of breastfeeding, the first baby usually helps that out a little bit and the second baby may not have as hard a time because um, it, it does draw these tiny little fibrous bands of, um, of uh, connective tissue. It, it snaps them one by one and so the nipple does stand out a little bit more. Um, so think of it as a positive thing. I, I'm sure that women go to plastic surgeons to have uh, flatter nipples corrected so that they have nice, perky, erect looking nipples like yours naturally do right now. Um, I would suggest that you um, go to a store where they know how to fit you for a bra uh, and try on a few different things and you will find something that looks nice and that feels comfortable for you. Um, and you may not, you may be surprised and not actually know what your size is. So your women often wear the wrong size bra um, and, you know, your band size, your bra size, sometimes people um, get them wrong. And so you'll feel a lot better when you have a nice supportive bra. Uh, and I am not, uh, I'm not an enemy of underwire by any means. Uh, if a woman has larger breasts and she needs that support, a well-fitting underwire bra while she's breastfeeding or not, uh, maybe what she's most comfortable in. So go for it. What else did I have on this? We'll get rid of this. Uh, this was, the, we, this, again, this was Valentine's Day. This was a whole um, webinar on love, sex, and uh, breastfeeding. It was really just on relationships. We didn't talk too much about breastfeeding. <laughs> Feeling sexy in your nursing bra? Not bloody likely. All right. Hillary, you know what to do. OK, next. This mom says, uh, trying to wean a five-week-old from formula supplementation started because of poor weight gain on fenugreek three capsules three times a day, blessed thistle three capsules three times a day, pumping two to three times a day, have him down to three to four ounces a day, okay, but I'm having a hard time getting him completely off. Mom feels like he is hungry after a few feedings a day and gets frustrated at the breast. Anything else I can do to help my supply and stop the formula? Five weeks. Hmm. Okay. Um, I, I was going to see if there's anything in here about weight gain. Weight gain. Um, how is this baby gaining weight? Very, very well or so-so or uh, and you know when was the how, how much heavy supplementation and how long has it been? Here's what I would say. You don't have to necessarily answer all those. 
Um, oh, Rebecca, you were at that webinar. I was there too. <laughs> um, here's what I would say, Kelly. I would say um, to follow his weight um, and use, uh, especially now that you're beginning to limit the supplementation, and you can't just, as you, just as you're doing it, you're doing it all right, you can't just stop um, supplementing a baby who is getting, you know, 10 to 12 ounces, and then 8 to 10 ounces, and then, you know, 5 to 8 ounces, and now he's getting 3 to 4 ounces, and um, he needs that milk, perhaps. Um, and especially as your body is, you know, slowly now getting the signal to make more milk and replace um, some of the formula, but until you're completely there, certainly um, the kid needs to eat. So I would track his weight carefully as you make these changes and make sure that he's continuing to gain half an ounce to an ounce a day at five weeks. That's what we would like to see, um, preferably an ounce, close to an ounce a day, but uh, half an ounce to an ounce is respectable. And, you know, it can be a little... Um, you don't have to weigh him. Certainly, I wouldn't. I wouldn't recommend test. You know, doing test weights, uh, and I also wouldn't recommend daily weigh daily weighing him because the minor um, variations can just begin to make you crazy. Um, so I would. I would. I would do maybe like um, you know tw a twice a week weight or once a week weight um, on an accurate scale, uh, and use that as an affirmation that that the baby's getting enough. Um, and I would also. Um, Keep in mind his age, which at five weeks uh, is at the peak of the most difficult time. Um, young babies essentially do three things. They eat, they sleep, and they fuss. If they're not eating or sleeping, you are, oh, there's the one I wanted to show. You are actively involved in um, keeping your baby happy. So uh, the fact that he doesn't seem milk drunk and take an hour and a half long nap after breastfeeding wouldn't surprise me in the least. Um, I wonder if after you have a good breastfeeding session, use breast compression, feed him on three breasts, put him in a sling or a carrier, go for a walk for, you know, do something, keep him moving for an hour. Um, does he nap? Does he doze? Does he seem reasonably content? And then after an hour and a half, he probably is going to want to eat again, and that's okay. He's going to want to eat more often as you begin to take him off um, the more frequent supplementation. And... Um, you, it's up to you if you want to offer him a pacifier or if you want to let him um, comfort, do a lot of comfort nursing on you, which actually can help your prolactin levels and your milk production as well. Um, but not assume that his fretfulness is always about hunger, and that's why I would document good weight gains uh, to reassure yourself. Because if he's gaining uh, an ounce a day, he's not doing that on three or four ounces of formula in a 24-hour period. Um, yeah. So good for you, good for you. Let's see, take a few more. Okay, baby's 10 weeks old, eating less. How much milk should she be getting now? Uh, what's a good reference as she continues to grow? Um, my question for this mom with a 10 week old and eating less is, um, do you mean nursing or drinking milk from a bottle that you're tracking? Because uh, a 10 week old is starting, thankfully, starting to have some hobbies. Um, she may like to have a cooing conversation with you and um, maybe even start blowing bubbles or um, eating her hands, um, maybe hold some, uh, a simple rattle in her hand and, and toss it, toss it um, out of her car seat. And, um, so she's starting to warm up to the world a little bit, and um, nursing may not be the only thing that she does. Also, she may be getting quite efficient. So whereas you may settle in for 20 or 30 or 40 minute feeding session, she may nurse for seven or 10 minutes and then decide that she's done. And she could get a full feeding. Not all babies. I'm not saying that a baby should only nurse for seven to 10 minutes, but I'm saying that certainly some babies can get um, a, an adequate belly of milk in that amount of time. So I would just focus on her diapers and her weight. And that's how you can know that she's getting enough milk. And um, her weight, again, she should probably be gaining somewhere between, um, let's see if I have a slide on this that have, have shows you the numbers. I think I do. Here we go. Yep, so um, it would be good if she were gaining somewhere between half an ounce to an ounce a day. I would like to push to the, to the ounce, um, which is the same thing as a quarter pound to half a pound a week, which is the same thing as one to two pounds a month. 
So if she is gaining weight nicely um, and she is wetting um, maybe six to eight wet diapers in a 24 hour period, you really can't go by poop at this point. With a 10 week old baby, she may poop uh, three or four times a day or she may poop once or twice a week. Either way is completely normal and completely fine. If a baby is only stooling once or once a week, uh, it still should be soft, loose liquid, um, and uh, it will be a little darker and a little stinkier because it's been sitting in there a little bit longer, but it's not constipation and um, it shouldn't be formed or any thicker than um, like uh, a thick mustard or um, not really even as thick as, as um, peanut butter. That's more, once they start eating solid food, they may have poop that's more the texture of peanut butter. Um, but uh, as, long as, as long as the weight gain is good and um, the peeing, the, the diaper output, the urine output is good, your baby's getting plenty of milk. So good job. Good job. Okay, I think we will, maybe let me see if I can have one more question. What's going on in the chat room? Anybody over here in the chat room have any questions? I think I've covered the questions in the in the in the Q and A box. Great. Okay. So um, it is Thursday. Um, on Tuesday we have our sleep webinar and chat, and I don't know what the topic is going to be. Uh, so maybe it will be all Q and A. And next Thursday I'm going to talk about my favorite breastfeeding uh, products. And it's World Breastfeeding Week, as I mentioned, so all of those favorite products are 20% off. Um, and I have a surprise that I will share next week, um, or even later today, hopefully, but I can't share it right now. Um, but it is a new online class that you can tell all your friends about, that I'm very excited about. Okay, have a fabulous week, and thank you for joining me in the breastfeeding webinar and chat. And thanks to Hillary for moderating and changing the decks around, and um, thanks to all you guys. And happy nurturing. Bye-bye.